The Women's Leadership Institute in the Auburn University College of Liberal Arts is pleased to present Leaders Educating Through Discussion. We hope you will take a moment after you watch our presentation to add your own voice to the dialogue on our website, auburn.edu slash women's leadership. Good afternoon. I'm very, very pleased to be here today. Um, and I want, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Jessie Parkhurst Guzman. Let me tell you a little bit about her. At a time when very few women were college graduates, let alone had advanced degrees, Jessie Parkhurst Guzman had both. She did her undergraduate uh, work at Howard mainly. She also had some undergraduate work at Clark, and she had a master's from Columbia. Uh, she held many, she came to uh, Tuskegee in 1923, uh, just shy of her 25th birthday, and she came to work as an assistant in the Department of Records and Research for a person by the name of Monroe Nathan Work, who is a very important early sociologist, and he's also someone who started the Department of Records and Research at Tuskegee, and at Tuskegee, he started the keeping of what, it, what, what are now known as the lynching files, because no white newspaper would um, report lynchings um, or would bury them. And so um, what um, Tuskegee did was collect records of lynchings and would publish an annual report. So he did a lot of really important work, and she came to be his assistant. She was there for more than four decades, and she held many, many roles at Tuskegee. She was a professor of sociology and history. She was dean of women for a while. She also um, later became, like work, the director of the Department of Records and Research. With him, she helped compile the Negro yearbooks and continued to publish that. And then um, later, when she became the director, the annual lynching report became a report on race relations in the South. So if Jessie Guzman had done nothing else, because she also wrote prize-winning historical articles and gave talks and wrote books, if she'd done nothing else, she would have already done plenty to leave a legacy for us at Tuskegee, and not just at Tuskegee, the state of Alabama and the country. But she did more than that. She was also an activist. She was a member of the Tuskegee um, Civic Association, and in 1950, she was chosen um, Tuskegee's Woman of the Year. Now, I, I need to tell you a little bit about the Tuskegee Civic Association and to kind of set the scene a little bit, because I know most of you in this room, although not everyone, uh, segregation is, is a, was, you never knew it. Um, I remember um, coming south to visit my grandmother and seeing the signs for the separate drinking fountains. But it was more than that. Um, you couldn't, you know, restaurants, no movie theaters. It was very segregated. And one thing that drove this point home to me was I heard a speaker say one time, well, you know, black Americans could not even try on clothes in a white store. You just had to buy. You couldn't try on clothes. So th that the TCA was formed, the Tuskegee Civic Association, to combat injustice, to do things like get fire hydrants on their side of town, but also do things like work on getting an equal education, work on unfairness in, in uh, employment. But a big one was voting, uh, because at this time, it was very hard to vote if you were a, an African American. If you, you had a master's degree like Jesse Guzman, you still had a hard time getting your voters registration because there was a very tough test. You had to ask, answer all kind of detailed questions about the U.S. Constitution. You had to find the registrars who sometimes hid or had irregular hours. Um, so what they were trying to do was keep the numbers of African Americans down in terms of voting. So there were people who were determined, like Jesse Guzman did register to vote, but she was um, an exception. Most people couldn't, and if, if you had difficulty reading, forget it. Now, remember, at the same time, and this eventually became part of a Supreme Court case, illiterate whites were able to register without any problem. So the effort was to, um, to, to keep um, blacks from exercising their rights. So the Tuskegee Civic Association began as, an, as a group to, to start this, but they had a very interesting idea. They wanted to educate people about citizenship. And I should also say that one of the interesting things is it started as a Tuskegee men's club, which also had its roots in a Tuskegee women's club started by Margaret Murray Washington to do good in the community, to help people in the community. But they soon discovered that 
it was a different organization when they decided to change their name from the Tuskegee Men's Club in 1941 and rewrite their constitution so that it was truly an equal group of men and women. And th at that, when they admitted women, it transformed the institution. It became a dynamic, um, eventually attracting thousands and played a very pivotal role in many um, civil rights struggles, which I'll tell you about one. Now, one of the things I'm showing you is the TCA Executive Committee in 1960. Five out of the executive members are women, and they tried to practice what they preached. They held elections. They were a very egalitarian structure, as some of the people that we've interviewed have. Della D. Sullins, who is on in that picture, is one person we've, we've talked to. Now, just imagine if one-third of the United States Senate was female, or one-third of you know, the legislature in the state of Alabama was female, it, it would look different. Um, Jesse Parkhurst Guzman was part of this group. She was, willing, she was a life member, one of a core group of dedicated um, activists. Um, she also um, uh, did, devoted years. Now, I want you to understand when we say willingness to work hard, the TCA started in 1941. Over years, they did civic education classes. They tried to help people register to vote. They embarked on a number of lawsuits. It was a long, painstaking struggle over many, many years, and she was part of that. And eventually, when they did become a political, there was a political entity, she became the chairman and founder of the uh, Macon County Democratic Club. But one of her most important and I think brave things that she did, she was the first person, the first black person, to run for office, public office, the County Board of Education, since Reconstruction, right? Since the 1900s, she was the she stepped up, and she believed women should step up and be candidates. And remember, this is at a time of intimidation, threats, some police brutality. People were not welcoming the participation of of black voters, let alone black candidates. But she ran. Now, this is what she. This is part of. Uh, what she said during her campaign speech. Um, she pointed out that Macon County at that time was 85% of its citizens were African Americans, and yet they held no office in any part of the government. Not the school board, not the sheriff, nothing. Um, and she made an appeal that, you know, this state of affairs is unjust. How can people who pay taxes, who are part of the community, not have a voice in the community? And she made an appeal to the white voters who, because of the shenanigans of the voting board, were the majority. It was roughly one-third um, white voters and two-thirds um, two white voters and one-third black voters. She made an appeal to those wh white voters, let me join with you, share some of your power, let me have a voice, because after all, four-fifths of the students in the school systems in Macon County were African Americans. Um, well, what happened, of course, she didn't win. And in fact, she was beaten three to one, and it pretty much divided along racial lines. There maybe were a few white voters who voted for her, but almost all the white voters in Macon County voted against her. And, but this running for office led to a very, very critical and interesting uh, decision on the part of some of the white power brokers, particularly Sam Englehart, who at that time was the, the state, uh, in the state legislature, and um, also the mayor of Tuskegee, um, Philip Lightfoot. Um, they decided, as she put it, because they, they could see that if more and more African Americans registered, then they might lose power. So. As she said, we were gerrymandered right out of the city of Tres Tuskegee by our state legislature. That's the whole state of Alabama. And threatened with piecemeal division of our county because we dared to express the desire to have a voice in our government. And that's what, um, that's what they did to Tuskegee. You know, Tuskegee is a normal shaped town. This, they drew this in the state legislature. It's called gerrymandering, and it means what they did was they drew the line such that every single registered black voter, with the exception of 12, because if they disenfranchised them, they would have had to disenfranchise a few white voters, every single black voter, with the exception of 12, was gerrymandered. They no longer were considered to be in Tuskegee. Therefore, the town of Tuskegee now had a 99% you know, white majority um, voting. 
Now, what was the result of this? This gerrymandering infuriated the TCA and infuriated the citizens of Tuskegee and Macon County. It had a lot of results that I'm sure that the Sam Engelharts were not counting on. Um, Tuskegee, uh, the Tuskegee Civic Association brought suit um, against the Tuskegee for doing this as unconstitutional. And in fact, the Supreme Court of the United States sided with them unanimously on November 14, 1960, that this kind of thing is totally unconstitutional. And though Guz Guzman lost, in a way she won the battle because more and more African Americans joined the TCA and what had, what had become, and, and the other thing that happened is there was, it wasn't a boycott because the TCA believed in operating within the law and boycotts were illegal in Alabama. So they called a program, as Della Sullins told us, trade with your friends, trade with your friends. So almost every black citizen in Macon County and Tuskegee traded with their friends. And like the Mus Montgomery Boys Buscott, it was devastating. A lot of white owned businesses went out of business. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit more about Jessie Guzman and, and her willingness to give credit and bring others forward. Um, she wrote a prize-winning article on Nathan Work uh, and, and what he had done for um, black people and also for America, right? Because this is our history too. Um, and she also wrote, she wrote many articles and, and gave many speeches, but one of her uh, most important ones is a book called The Crusade for Democracy, which documents, and if you're interested, I really recommend this book because it, it tells in depth the struggles of the TCA and what they did to bring about um, the end to segregation in the South. Um, now, what's also interesting, and this is an area for, um, for research, for continuing research, um, you know, Charles Gomillion and many of the people in the TCA really felt strongly that the mission of the TCA was to operate within the law and to go by the Constitution. They believed in the Constitution. You know, more radical elements of the civil rights movement, um, like um, the student nonviolent, nonviolent the SNCC, I was nonviolent coordinating committee, um, they wanted more confrontation. They wanted nonviolence, but they wanted more confrontation. And and that was something that um, I think some people in the TCA were uncertain about. But Guzman was sympathetic and, and, and very um, and, and, and appreciative of what uh, young Americans were doing, both black and white, to challenge this, the, the system of segregation. Um, this is a picture of Jesse Guzman and Charles Gomillion. And um, I don't know what the occasion is. I like to think it's one of their many, many talks that perhaps, because she gave a lot of talks for the Tuskegee Civic Association. Um, Jesse Guzman was willing to change, too. Um, she worked across racial lines. She was a member of the Southern Conference Educational Fund. They, were, they funded white college students to go to Mississippi to help in, in voter registration movements. Um, she worked with the Women's International uh, League for Peace and Freedom. And, you know, at one point she even wrote that, you know, Tuskegee itself might have to someday think about admitting white teachers. So here I am. <laughs> but she foresaw it in the 50s at a time when it was unthinkable because it was such a segregated place. But she thought that white teachers and students should be welcomed at Tuskegee. Otherwise, it would be hypocrisy. And it's true. They are welcomed at Tuskegee. Um, and in all ways, she is, was willing to share her knowledge. <coughs> Um, I hope you'll agree today that, that uh, Tuskegee de should be proud of its daughters. Um, we've only scratched the surface, but I hope we've given you a deeper appreciation for what a group of people coming together to work for a higher good can do um, when they're inspired by each other. Tuskegee was co-educational from the beginning, and it had that energy from the beginning. Um, our preliminary findings are that women have been crucial to the success of Tuskegee and that they have Graduates have carried on that legacy in many arenas. Today we've talked about track and field, we've talked about women in the military, and we've talked about the civil rights movement. And they've blazed new paths in those arenas and others. Um, these are some discussion questions that 
uh, since we won't really turn it into a lecture of that sort, what kinds of things can happen when women become part of a group, when women work not only with other women, but also with men. Um, we'd like to credit today um, Dana Chandler uh, and Cheryl Ferguson at, at the Tuskegee Archives who helped us with many of the photographs and in other ways it, giving us information um, as we've done our research. Um, we'd also like to, to thank the many, many Tuskegee women who've shared their stories with us.